Good evening, everyone. Good evening. This is a wonderful, wonderful holiday day. It's Memorial Day 2020, 2022. And uh, we're excited about being with you on tonight. We're going to talk about a very important subject on tonight. It is going to change your life. It certainly has helped me move from a place where I had just been stuck for a long time. And this is what are the, the final part that we're going to be talking about when we're talking about the Holy Spirit is our enabler and is our helper when we're planting good seed on good ground so that we can experience the harvest that God has planned for us. And not only that, but we can give birth to spiritual things that belong to God and that not that those things that belong to the enemy. So we're excited about being here tonight to talk to you about that. Um, it's really an honor to have you with us. And we are excited about you learning and me learning and all that will watch this via, um, all that will watch this via our social media platforms, whether it be, um, whether it be Facebook or any of the others, we were just excited about that. Uh, so we were, we're waiting a few minutes for Michelle to get on. This is a holiday. And so we know that uh, people are, some people are out there enjoying the beginning of spring, the beginning of summer, the beginning of warm weather, the beach or cookouts or whatever else they're doing. And um, so that's just exciting to us. We're gonna, okay. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. You cannot hear me. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Now you on mute. Now you on mute. Now you on mute. You on mute. Can you hear me now? You still can't hear me. Wait a minute. Okay, so I can hear you. You still can't hear me? Can you hear me, Michelle? I can hear you. Okay, Evan, uh, Ms. Coleman, you're on mute. Yeah. She's on mute, but she should be able to hear me. She cannot hear me. I don't know how to fix that. Uh, okay, I can hear you. So your your volume is on. Okay, so uh, let me see. It's you uh, put in the chat. Um, let me unmute. Let me give it to you. Let me give it to you so you can talk to her. Okay. Okay. Let me give it to you. You have it? Okay, I might. <clears throat> Let me see. You have it? Let me see. Okay, can you see the presentation? Okay. Let me um let me check with um uh, Evelyn. Let her know it's her. 
uh, is not us. Uh, uh, she can't hear me, so try and see if she can hear you. Hold on a minute. I can't even get the chat to work. Hello. Hi. Uh, okay. You, you, we can't. I think we're having a problem can with you, Elder Evelyn, because we're able to hear each other. Okay. Okay. I see. I'm muted. Okay. Okay. Now I can hear. All right. Okay. So that's wonderful. We can get started. This is a holiday, and uh, I had just started talking about the the holiday and. The, uh, this is the last session that we're going to be doing on this portion of it. So we're going to uh, jump right into it now. Michelle, if you bring up the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint, we can jump right into that. We know that a lot of people are out enjoying themselves with, the, with this, in this holiday season. So we want to welcome all of you who are going to watch this tonight and later to Lace, Love Applied Can Endure. We're going to uh, talk about the Holy Spirit on tonight. But in case you need to contact me, uh, you can do that by writing me at um, 150 Post Office uh, Road, Suite 1027 in Waldorf, Maryland, 20604. Or you can email me at drcbwhite at gmail.com. And of course, you can visit my website at cbwhite.com. And if you desire to watch these again, our YouTube channel is Dr. C.B. White Lace. So, Please contact us if you desire. Share this with somebody. I know that there are lots of people who would want to have this information. Uh, we're talking tonight about the power of the earth. Uh, we're coming from one of my books, The Power of the Earth. You can get that book on Amazon uh, if you desire to have the full information about it. We're not going to cover all of that as we go through the session for this particular thing, but we are going to try to re, uh, cover as much of it as we can so that we can give to you this information and you can apply it in your life and change your life. So we're gonna be talking about that on tonight. Um, and we're gonna be talking about peace on tonight. So now uh, we're continuing our uh, discussion on Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. And we're gonna be talking about the peace on tonight. Uh, and, and how do you get peace? How do you get peace? I've talked to so many people, including myself, that they just want to be, you know, when you get in a, a certain situation, you just want peace. You just want this thing to stop. You want some, some people to stop doing what they're doing. You, you don't want the pressure of it. And so I've heard so many say, I just want peace. I just want peace. You know, and it, it could be anything from being a pain uh, psychologically, emotionally, uh, sometimes even physically, but most of the time it's emotionally and psychologically. The pain is just, you just want the person to stop doing what they're doing, or you want not go through what you're going through. You just want peace. You just want peace. And so this is the last part of what we're going to be talking about, the Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. He is our peace. He helps us with our peace. You know, Jesus is, is the Prince of Peace. So Holy Spirit helps us with our peace. And we're gonna be talking about that on tonight because we uh, have uh, very familiar scriptures that we have been studying. If you've been in the body of Christ more than you know, th three or four years, you probably heard this scripture many times, but we haven't been able to apply it practically in our life. So we're gonna jump into that on tonight. And we're still in, uh, we're still in um, John chapter 14, and we're going to go on through that part of it and we're going to be talking about the peace now we have one other scripture that we're going to spend a lot of time on tonight and that's the one that we're familiar with i'm not talking about this one i'm talking about the one that we're going to get to a little bit later so let's go let's uh, let's do this one let's do this slide holy spirit our enabler and our helper jesus is now ready for them to settle whatever they need to settle concerning what's about to happen he wanted them to receive his peace and he gave them 
an explanation of what that peace, what the peace that he was giving them was all about in verses 27 through 31. Peace I leave with you, my own peace. I now give you, bequeath to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. Do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. You heard me tell you I am going away and I'm coming back to you. If you really love me, you would have been glad because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater and mightier than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does take place, you may believe and have faith in and rely on me. I will not talk with you much more for the prince, the evil genius, the ruler of this world is coming and he has no claim on me. He has nothing in common with me. There is nothing in me that belongs to him and he has no power over me. But Satan is coming and I, I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know, be convinced that I love the father and that I do only what the father has instructed me to do. I act in full agreement with his orders. And so he says, rise, let us go away. So he's finishing up that discussion with him. And, and so now let's take a look at that. He's told them that he, um, uh, about the crucifixion. He has told them that he's leaving. He has told them that he's sending another comforter like himself. He has explained being uh, the word and he is the truth. And he has explained the spirit of truth, which is Holy Spirit. And he's explained the power and the, I mean, the price that has to be paid, the price that has to be paid. So he's talking about this and, and as we get into this further discussion, let me just say to everyone, everyone watching, um, everyone watching, hello, Jackie, it's good to see you again. We are in control of our peace. You know, when we say, I just want peace, I just want them to stop doing that. I just want this to stop, or I just want that to stop. Uh, we are in control of our peace. Other people, are not in control of our peace. Only we can give ourselves peace. And we do that by letting the Holy Spirit help us do it. So when Jesus said, do not, do not um, permit yourself and give yourself to the peace of this world, what was he talking about? What was he talking about? And he, he gave his examples up there. So let's, let's talk about the peace of this world. Uh, what the world calls peace. You know, he says, peace, not as the world calls peace. Uh, so what kind of peace is this? Um, it's the kind of thing that we permit where Satan has claimed and he can touch it and cause us trouble. So he says in the beginning, let not your heart be troubled. So we know we have to guard our heart from certain things. And there are eight things that he talks about here that keeps us from having peace if we permit it. We have to permit uh, our peace to be disturbed. It cannot happen unless we permit it. And then after we talk about this, we're gonna talk about what to do instead of this. But the first thing that he says was, uh, don't let your heart be troubled. He's talking about your heart. And what he's saying is, and so we're getting these dictionary uh, definitions from the Oxford Dictionary and so that we can understand really more detail about what he's talking about. So when he says, don't be troubled, that means don't be worried about problems or conflicts and the storms are gonna come, but they do not stay long. Do not let storms take your peace. Now, if you've ever been in a storm, if you've ever seen a storm, they don't stay longer than 10, 15, no more than 30 minutes. That, that's a long time for a storm, but we would make a real bad decision during that time of the storm. We would do something that would cause our peace to be disturbed. And, and, and then we would wonder what in the world happened. And then we'll try to blame it on something else, but we can't because we're in charge of our peace. 
So when trouble comes, when storms come, we have to rely on what God told us to do. We have to rely on the word. And sometimes we're going through trials, tribulations, persecutions, whatever those things are that we're going through. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Do not be worried. Why would he say that? Because he is the Prince of Peace. And if we are relying on the word of God, if we're relying on what Jesus has said, then we are not going to be disturbed. You know, so you say, well, how do you do this? Well, you got this big conflict in your life. Something comes up, you know, uh, you get, you're getting ready to, I think I did this one time. <laughs> I was trying to go down to uh, my great aunt's funeral in Jackson, Mississippi. And I got on, I, I got on a plane, it was fine here, but Mississippi had ice. We're, we're comfortable with ice. We know what to do with ice. So the plane here was no problem. But when I got to Atlanta, I could go no further. I could go no further. And that was a big conflict for me. I was really upset because the plane tickets back in those days, that was quite expensive and I couldn't go and I couldn't get any further. So I called, I called up, I just caused myself all kinds of problems. And so I called up my friend, Dolly, which is um, Jackie's sister. And I told her, I said, what am I gonna do? I gotta get a Jackson. <laughs> she said, calm down, calm down. Let's just rent a car and drive. I said, drive? I never thought about that, but we did. She calmed me down. But see, if I had known and understood what I know now, I probably would have just gone, I spent the day with her, had a had spent the night with her, had a good visit with her, and and then uh go home, go back home. That's what I should have done. <laughs> but I didn't. I, I just acted up and she just tried to calm me down because I wanted to get to Mississippi. I really did that. That lady was an important part of my life. Her husband saved my life. And I just I just felt like I got to go there. Now you say, well, how did he do that? I caught myself on fire. And I was cooking back in those days. Um, we had gas stoves in Jackson. And, um, and the, there were flames in the bottom part of the stove. And so I was fixing uh, myself some toast, which I shouldn't have been doing. And I didn't understand how to do it, but I just decided not to do it myself and not to wait on any adults to come. And I had on a starch dress. You know, back in those days, you had, to, you had to starch your clothes to get the wrinkles out of them. And I turned around and my dress caught on fire. My whole dress was burning. I was burning. And I was screaming and hollering. And her husband came and got a blanket, a quilt, and rolled me in it and put out the fire. That's what saved my life. I wanted to get to that funeral really bad. So Dolly and I got in this car and we drove to Birmingham. Then we got to Birmingham and we couldn't get any further. All the roads were closed in Birmingham. <laughs> we had to come back to Atlanta anyway. Look how much money I wasted, you know, by not paying attention. I know that those people in the South don't deal with snow and ice. I lived there, so I knew that, you know. But I let my peace be disturbed because I didn't trust God and I didn't understand. This is something that you just need to not do. So that's one of the that's one of the examples I just want to give you. Since things like that happen, we have to not be worried. We have to not, you know, just just go off in space somewhere with this with these crazy ideas. So we can't let our heart be troubled. And so the next one is afraid. He said, "Don't be afraid. Afraid is feeling fear from the dictionary or anxiety. So fear, fear is false evidence." appearing real. I mean, we've said that a lot. I don't know who, who came up with that. It wasn't me, uh, but I'm quoting it from somewhere. I don't even know who came up with it. But I do know that 99.9% .9 of the things that we fear never happen. If 99% of the things we fear never happen, why do we keep getting afraid? We can, why? <laughs> why? Because, because the prince of this world, he's doing, Jesus said, he was an evil genius. He was a genius at tricking us. So we can't, we can't let him do it, you know? So 
if if 99% of the things that never happen, we should never let fear cause us not to have peace. The next thing he said was agitated. And agitation is being nervous or upset. So we cannot let agitation or be upset about things. We have to follow the word of God. We have to follow the word of God. That's what we have to do. Follow the word of God. Don't get agitated. Don't get upset. What did the word of God say about this? And that's part of the problem we have. And the reason we have a, a, a problem with, with, with it is because we're not taught it and we don't understand when we don't do these things and we get to the other part, I'll explain that better, what Jesus said to do, the devil can't do anything. These are the things that he has a hold of. He can't do anything. And but if we do this, we don't allow Holy Spirit to help us. We just give the devil opportunity to, to make us feel worse and take our peace from us because that's how the world deals with peace. Now, the next one is being fearful. That's being terrified. You know how the world deal with that. You know, if, if you're trying to get yourself straight with some company or some organization and they don't want to do it, or they give you all kinds of uh, terrifying information about why they can't do it, why you can't do it, and this and that and the other. Or if it's individuals, you know, people like to get people back. They like revenge. That's what they call peace. That's what the world called peace. But Jesus said, don't get tied up in that because that's not peace. So when you're having, uh, when you when you're getting agitated like that, you just follow the word of God. And the next thing he said uh, was, don't be disturbed. And being disturbed is having a normal pattern or uh, something normal that you have been doing, um, be disturbed. Okay, so if you get challenged because of whatever it is that you normally do, you can't do anymore, or you can't do right now, or there's a temporary disruption he says, don't be terrified with that. Don't be terrified. Do not let people and situations terrify you. And we were just talking about that. You know, uh, people would like to do that. They would like to terrify you by telling you this and this is going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, whatever it is, um, we can't let people or situations terrify us. We have to stay with the word of God. And we have to keep peace. So you say, well, how suppose it's something physical? Well, then we have to call on Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi because he fights our battles. Jehovah Nisi, we call him. Uh, he's our banner. He fights our battle. So we call on him. And I told you that story before. That's what I do. I trust Jehovah Nisi because I do a lot of things by myself. And I'm not afraid to do them by myself because God is with me. Jehovah Nisi is with me. So I don't let those kinds of things bother me. How about intimidated? Intimidation is when someone tries to make someone else do what they want them to do by controlling them. And that's the, that particular personal situation or company or whatever it is, is trying to take dominion over you or me. We can't let people have dominion over us because only God has that dominion. So when we let people have dominion over us, they become our God. So we want to be careful. We want to be careful and not do that and, and not let people take control so that that takes our peace away. Nothing grabs peace faster than somebody trying to have dominion over somebody else. It just disturbs people because <laughs> they're not supposed to. They're not supposed to. And that God-like uh, spirit in them fights it fights it because it's trying to take over God's position. And then the next one is we don't be cowardly. Don't be faint hearted. Have courage when these things are happening. Have courage. You know, uh, I remember a lot of times in the Bible where um, God had to tell people that he's with to have courage, like he had to tell Joshua. Well, Joshua didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do. So he had to tell Joshua, have courage. Have courage. Don't be faint hearted in this. So that's what we have to do. If we want to keep our peace, we have to use our courage. We have to use our courage. And the last one is not unsettled. Don't be unsettled. Lacking stability. 
you have to be stable in what you do. Can't go back and forth. Well, maybe it's this way, and then maybe it's the other way. Maybe it's this way, and maybe it's the other way. So we can't go back and forth like that. And uh, so those are the things that uh, represent the peace of this world. And those are the things that God is telling us, don't do. Jesus is saying, don't do that. That, that Don't be like that. That's not what I want you to do. I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to go. I'm getting ready to be crucified. I am, I've already told you that I'm the word of God. I already told you that the word is truth and it's the only truth there is. And I've already introduced you to the fact that the spirit of truth is going to be here with you. And when you have the truth, it will make you free. You will not have to be bound up if you have the truth. And so now he's telling them about peace. He's telling them what they have to do to keep their peace. If you do any of these things, you're certainly not going to have any peace because Jesus is just explaining this in John 14, verse 27 through 31. But then he says 10 things I want you to do. The first one I want you to do is obey me. And we're still in, in John 27 through 31. He says, because I'm going to the father and he's greater than me. Now, Jesus is talking as the son of man. He's not talking about being God, being Christ. He's, he's saying, the father is God. He's greater than me. I'm obeying him. I want you to do what I do. I'm, I'm here in Adam's position. I am the second Adam. I'm obeying him. I want you to do that. And he says, I'm telling you this in advance. I'm telling you everything that's going to happen in advance so that you will know it. And so we talked last week about Holy Spirit making sure that we don't get uh, um, waylaid, that we don't get surprised by anything. Because if we ask him, if we keep him prevalent in our life, if we keep him constant in our life, he'll tell us when things are going to happen. He'll tell us. So then if we have, it said, all you have to do is have faith in me and believe me. That's all you have to do. So believing in Jesus and having faith in Jesus fosters peace. Because all of those things that we just talked about a few minutes ago, when they show up, we have to go to Jesus but we have to believe in him and have faith in him if we're going to stop doing these things that I just mentioned that the world considers peace. That's what we're going to have to do. That fosters the peace, you know. And he goes on to say, listen, you have to be like me. You have to be like me. And he goes on to explain that the devil has no claim over me. So what's he saying to us? He's saying, let Holy Spirit help you get rid of the darkness that's in you, the sin issues that you have, that's what the devil has claim on. He don't have any claim over me because I don't have any sin issues, but I want you to let Holy Spirit help you get rid of yours because I know that you do. I know that you do. So therefore, you need Holy Spirit and you have to permit him to help you so that the devil will have nothing on you. So you say, well, I don't seek the devil. Well, we talked about that last week. We don't seek the devil, but we're born in sin. And so until we're saved again, we can't produce anything but sinful things. And we have been exposed to all of this sin and all of this working of sin all of this time. And now that we are saved, the devil wants to keep us in sin, but he can't because we're free. We are free. And so he, but he keeps showing up in these areas that I was talking to you about, you know, being troubled, being afraid, being agitated being disturbed, being fearful, uh, being intimidated and acting cowardly and being unsettled. When we do those things, he has a hope and that's what he wants to use because he's a genius at that. If one don't work, he'll try the other one. So he go down to all the lists that he has to try to get one that works, but we have to resist him. We have to resist him and have our trust and our faith in Jesus and believe what he said. And then Jesus said, okay, he, the devil has nothing in common with me because he had already mentioned that the devil is an evil genius and he's a ruler of this world and he's coming. He's coming and he's going to disturb you. And I'm just telling you right now what you have to do. He has nothing in common with me. So we have to let Holy Spirit help us obey the word. When we obey the word of God, it really doesn't matter what's still left in us. He can't do anything with the word. Whatever else we're dealing with, when we're working out our soul salvation, if we go ahead and say the word of God over that, no matter what is in us, the devil can't do anything about it. 
so there should be nothing in us in common with me, he said. But if we use the word of God, then we're using Jesus. And when we're using Jesus, there's nothing in him that's common with the devil. And so the devil can't do anything. And then he says, uh, there's nothing in me that belongs to him. So now we know that we have a challenge with that. So we have to let Holy Spirit help us hurt, help us heal our hurts and our pains, our disappointments, our misuse, our abuse, and all the things that has probably happened to us during our lifetime before we got saved and some even after we got saved. We have to let Holy Spirit help us do that. And we talked last week about he will help us do that. And he'll do it in secret. And we'll get rid of that stuff and nobody will know but you and him. And you'll be willing to tell it when you run into somebody else that has what you had and now you're free. You're now you're free. So the devil you know, can't do anything about things that you're working on. If you're working on something with, 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 with Holy Spirit, the devil can't, can't beat you up with that. God's not going to let him. He's not going to let him, him have that, you know? So then he says, uh, he has no power over me. So that's why we have to speak the word of God because we know that he has no power over Jesus. So he has no power over us because we're his brother and because we're the child of God and because we're saved, he has no power over us. So whatever presently is happening in our lives, we can't repeat that because if we repeat that, uh, the devil can grab it and, and create that for us and produce that for us. So you say, well, what's an example of that? I mean, you know, well, I tell you one of the greatest examples that I, I have that I, that I try to help people with all the time. You know what people say when, when they make a mistake or they want to apologize? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Don't say that. That's, that's a, you are not sorry. You don't want the devil to make you sorry. You know, whatever definition that sorry is, you are creating it when you say it. If you make a mistake, you are supposed to say, I apologize or forgive me. Do not say I'm sorry. Don't say that. Okay, well, how about something else simple? I'm, I'm not talking about sin now. I'm talking about things that the devil can hook into and cause us havoc and steal our peace. How about another one we say out there? I am so tired. I need some, I, I'm so tired. I have worked, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. Well, guess what? You, you have what you say. If you say you're tired, you are going to be even more tired than you are right now. You have to say, I need rest. If you say, I need rest, then you are creating what you really need. You need rest. You don't need more tiredness. We need rest. And so we have to, can't let the devil take that away from us. And Jesus is showing us how to do that, you know. And then when he says, uh, you know, when Satan comes, and he will come, when he comes, he says, I, I want the world to know that I love the father because I'm going to obey him. I'm going to do what he says do. I'm going to show the world, that's number 10. I'm going to show the world that I love the father. I do only what the father has instructed me to do. And what he's saying to us, do only what the word has instructed you to do. And you say, well, wait a minute. That's Jesus. You just said, do what the father do. Well, let me explain like I did last week. They are one in the Godhead, but they have separate jobs. The father thinks the thing. We went over that in Genesis last week. The son speaks the thing and the Holy Spirit does the thing. So the father is giving this information to Jesus. He is speaking it in his word. And when we speak his word, the Holy Spirit will do what we just said, because that's how, how Jesus he did it for Jesus. That is how he did it for Jesus. So I want to go over that one more time. The father thinks a thing. that we went over that in Genesis. When we were looking at that in Genesis, the father said, let us make man. Well, he didn't say it. He thought it. Jesus said. Jesus said it. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit did it. So we have to understand 
we have to let Holy Spirit do his job by allowing him to be an intimate part of our life. So Jesus said, I am in full agreement with the Father's orders. And so what's our part? Our part is to be in full agreement with the word of God and let the Holy Spirit make that word happen for us. Because when we speak it, it will be done. Can, Satan cannot stop that word and of God. So we seek the Holy Spirit's help to help us get rid of our sinful baggage, our sinful clutter that's in our hearts because Satan is attached to those things and we want to not have them so he will have nothing in us that he can touch. So Jesus is saying that. He said that because he was explaining that. And, and it's very important that we understand that. It's very important that we understand that because we have given up our peace because we didn't understand about the peace and we didn't understand that we have the peace. You know, so um, we're going to go on to the next slide because the next, the next chapter, uh, we're going to go through a whole chapter after this next slide and you're going to be surprised about what it is because you have studied it probably as much, if not more, than I have. Um, and um, this passage is very interesting to me because most of the people do not pay attention to what Jesus' command, what Jesus command them to do, which is appropriate for us today. He says, stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. Do not permit yourself to be fearful, intimidated, cowardly and unsettled. In this same passage, he tells them, I need you to obey me in this because this is what will keep you safe. I'm telling you in advance so that you will know what to expect and recognize it when it comes to you and will believe and have faith and know that you can rely on me. Now, this is the key to remember. Jesus said, I will not be talking to you much. Therefore, you have to remember what I told you because Satan is coming. And even though he is an evil genius, he has no claim on me, he has nothing in common with me, there's nothing in me that belongs to him and he has no power over me. Then he told them, I do as the father has commanded me so the world may know, be convinced that I love the father and I do only what the father has instructed me to do. I act in full agreement with his orders. Now they know he's not asking them to do something that he is not doing. So he's not asking you and I to do something that he didn't do. It is important that we understand what it means for us to have anything in us or on us that Satan can claim, that we have nothing in common with him and that we have nothing in us that belongs to him. And finally, that he has no power over us. That's very important for us to understand if we are going to operate and if we are going to take control of our own peace. Okay, so let's go to the next one, Michelle, the next slide. We wanted to review that. Not gonna get to come back to that, but that's very important. So we reviewed that one. This one, we're still talking about the Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. We know that Jesus has freed us from the penalty and power of sin, but we must be willing to let Holy Spirit, our comforter, help us get rid of the things that we may have in common with Satan. Things like unforgiveness, strife and envy, we must also have nothing in us that Satan can touch because those are the things that he used for his benefit. Many times those things are in us, but we had nothing to do with what happened to us to cause the problem. You know, it may have happened when we were a child. It may be a generational curse that's been passed down, but we have Holy Spirit and he will help us with all things. We all have things that are not in agreement with the word of God that we need to get rid of. And sometimes they may seem insignificant, but God sees it all. So for instance, worry, fear, doubt, and unbelief, low self-esteem, low self-worth, et cetera. I don't know about you, but I have heard some Christians explain things like uh, they're big sins and uh, are different from things that are small sins, which are, uh, but there are no big or small sins, they're all sin. There are no little white lies. You, you ever heard people say that? 
oh, that was just a little white lie. No, there are no little white lies. They all are lies. And even though we would like to think that people who have visible sins, like adultery, is different from those who are done in secret, like hoarding and pornography. Even if we do not know what to pray for or what to ask for help with, we can be comforted because Jesus sent us help in that area also. So Paul mentions this in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which, we can, which cannot be uttered. Now, this is the chapter that we spent a lot of time on, but we have not implemented, in it, implemented it in our life. And I think it's because we have not understood how. So we're gonna cover the whole chapter of Romans 8 tonight. And after tonight, you will be able to implement this in your life. And it's not gonna be difficult to do. And as you start doing that, you're gonna see the changes happen. You're gonna be able to have family members, friends, church, wherever you're going. It's going to be different because you're going to be different. You know, they may not even recognize uh, uh, oh, they won't know the reason why, but they will recognize the difference because you're going to have a different attitude about it because you understand it better. And so I'm going to read portions of the scripture and then we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about it for a minute and until we get to the end of this chapter. So let's start with, and, and we're talking about, uh, this chapter is talking about escaping from bondage. You know, a lot of times what we think that we can't get rid of bondage unless we go to a deliverance service, you know, <laughs> and we can't get rid of things like that. You go to a deliverance service to get rid of it. Otherwise we're stuck. Well, chapter eight says that we're not stuck. So let's, let's go through this. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. This is Romans chapter eight. You know, you can follow me in your Bible. I'm going to read. Uh, chapters first, I'm going to read chapters uh, verse one through eight. Therefore, there is no condemnation, no guilty verdict, no punishment for those who are in Christ, who believe in him as personal Lord and Savior. For the law of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do that is overcome sin and remove it, uh, its penalty, its power being weakened by the flesh, man's nature without Holy Spirit, God did. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful man as an offering for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh, seduced it, overcame it in the person of his own son so that the righteous and just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live our lives in the way of the flesh, guided by worldliness in our sinful nature, but live our lives in the ways of the spirit guided by his power. And, then, and that's what we were talking about. We, we need to be guided by the spirit's power. And, and I'm stopping here at verse four, because I want to tell you that when I start practicing this, it takes a lot uh, for you to really just stop and think about when you say, Holy Spirit, be with me all day. You know, when I speak, you speak, whatever I do, you do. And I found myself, he was doing things. And I found myself, you know how you think that you were doing it? And that's how we think that we're doing. I found myself after I did something or didn't do something, realizing that he was helping me realizing that he would give me a thought. He would give me a thought and I would, if I moved on that thought, I would get the results of it. And if I didn't, and I saw what happened because I didn't, I knew that he had given me the correct thing to do that I did not do. And so I'm really working on that. I'm really working on that. I encourage you to do the same thing because that's what this is about. The Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. He is our enabler and our helper. We have to allow him to do that by including him in everything we do or say or think because he's not going to do anything unless we ask him. He's not going to do jump in and just usurp our uh, authority that we have on the earth because we have dominion, 
because he know better. He know we're getting ready to mess up. But if we ask him, he will do whatever it is we need done. So verse five goes on to say, for those who are living according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those things are living according to the spirit. But those that are living according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit and will his will and purpose. Now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace and the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God. But now and forever, the mind of the flesh, which with its sinful pursuits, is actively hostile to God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh living a life that uh, caters to the sinful appetites and impulses cannot please God. So what are we talking about here now? We're talking about dying to our flesh. That, that's the reason we kill our flesh. You know, we talk about killing our flesh daily. And, and so when we're taught this in church or when we're studying this on our own, we have to understand that when we kill our flesh, what we're doing is we are assassinating those sinful appetites and impulses by killing our flesh because the mind of the flesh brings sin and death, but the mind of the spirit brings life and peace. So we're talking peace here and the spiritual well-being that comes with walking with God. So therefore, when we kill the flesh, and we're going to talk about that a little later in the same passage, we're going to see why God tells us that we have to participate in his suffering. So let's go from verse 9 through uh, verse 11 here. However, you are not living in the flesh, controlled by the sin for nature, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God lives in you, directing and guiding you, which is what we've been talking about, uh, this whole session on Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him and is not a child of God. If Christ lives in you, through you, uh, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which he provides. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he raised Christ, he who raised Christ, Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who lives in you. So that good ground that God's got, that we're growing things in, we're growing and birthing the things of God in, it lives in you. So therefore, we can do things in God because of that. But we have to daily, and Paul said, we have to kill our flesh. That's what this verse means. You know, when we're talking about, when we're talking about um, being in Christ, God expects us not to walk in our flesh, not to live in our flesh. So now verse 12 uh, Verse 12 through 13 says, so then brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but not to our flesh. We, now, what did it say? We have an obligation, but not to our flesh, our human nature, our worldliness, our sinful capacity to live according to the impulses of the flesh, our nature without Holy Spirit. For if you are living according to the impulses of the flesh, you are going to die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are going to, you are habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. Regularly, really live forever. So you have to really do that. So if you're living according to the impulses of your flesh, you're going to die in that. that, that that's going to die. But if you're living by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you're putting to death sin for these in the body, you will really live forever. You're doing that. We're doing that, but we have to understand that we have to do it regularly and we have to participate 
with Holy Spirit. And sometimes when the Holy Spirit put a thought in my mind to do something, it's not necessarily something I want to do, you know, because I had already made up my mind what I thought I was going to do. And then I get a, 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 a thought from him. And, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, if you just submit to that, he's so faithful. You know, when I'm working on something financial and I'm working uh, on something that had to do with finances, he'll tell me, don't do that today. Wait till tomorrow. And I find out why I needed not to do that today. Or he'll tell me, no, don't do that one first. Do that one last. Do this one here. Do this one first. You know, that that is an intimate uh, information about what to do with your life, what to do on a daily basis. But we think it's us that are speaking. And so sometimes we'll decide not to do it because we came up with something else on our own. But the first, when we ask God to help us like that, when we ask God to be an intimate part of our life like that and be with us all day long and help us say what we're gonna say, do what we're gonna do, think what we're gonna think, the first thought we should get is that's God and try it. That's God because he's faithful. When we ask him to do stuff, he'll do it. And he starts doing it the minute we ask. So therefore, that first thought we get, Go with it. See where it leads you. Don't come up with another one. You know, he'll tell me. I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll get the impression I, I need to go to the store today. And then I'll think about, it. oh, I'll wait till tomorrow. You know, <clears throat> what I found out was if I, if I go today, I'll get what I want to. But tomorrow he knows what I want will be out of stock. So if I don't go today, I'm not going to get what I want. That's just how detailed he is about helping us. So verse 14 and 15 says, for all who are allowing themselves to be led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading again to fear of God's judgment, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, the spirit producing sonship by which we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. So therefore, when we hear stuff and God wants to do stuff that we don't agree with, he's not punishing us. He's raising us up as his sons. And that's what parents do. You know, kids come up with things, children come up with things, you know, they like to do other than what God is telling them to do. Uh, and that, that happens in the natural as well. You know, if you, if you ever around children, they, they come up with some things that's not good for them. But as an adult, you know that they shouldn't be doing it. So. We must uh, understand this, that he's not punishing us. We are enjoying the privilege and the honor of his sonship. And because of that, we can uh, joyfully cry, Abba Father, and be excited that we're allowing Holy Spirit to do his job. And that's to make things happen according to the word of God that we use or according to a desire of our heart that's in agreement with the word of God. You know, what we want, God wants us to have it, but it must be in agreement with the word of God for Holy Spirit to be able to help us. So let's look at 16 through 17. And it says the spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God. And then if we are his children, then we are his heirs, also heirs of God, and follow, and follow heirs with Christ and fellow heirs with Christ sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance. And indeed we share in his suffering so that we may also share in his glory. Okay, now this one is a big one right here because we don't like to share in his suffering. Uh, so we stop, so we're gonna have to stop rejecting suffering because suffering produces resurrection power over those deeds that we're trying to get rid of. So when we kill our flesh, we suffer. When we decide to kill our flesh, we suffer. But then during that suffering process, that painful process, the resurrection of, power of God is overcoming that deed that we're, that we're trying to get rid of. So you say, well, that makes, that doesn't make any sense, you know? Well, let me ask you something. 
<clears throat> the physical body does the same thing. And so we're talking about the natural things in this, in this particular teaching that I do, we're talking about the natural things that, that um, the show spiritual truth. If something is wrong with your body, how do you know? You know because it's hurting. You're in pain. <laughs> You're in pain. If something is wrong and God needs correction in your spirit, man, you're going to go through some emotional and psychological pains because there's something that's attached to that pain that needs to go. That's how you know. That's how you know. So if you got a toothache, you know you gotta go take care of the teeth. You wouldn't know that you had a tooth that was rottening until the nerves started giving you pain. So we fight the thing that's teaching us what's wrong so that we can get it corrected. So we have to suffer through the pain and the suffering so that we can enjoy the resurrection power that destroys that thing that caused the pain. Does that make sense? Anybody understand that? That thing that caused the pain gets destroyed by his resurrection power. And he said the spirit himself, he testifies of our, you know, of, uh, together with our spirit, because we are the uh, children of God, the Holy Spirit is doing his job. So what do we need resurrection power over? We need resurrection power over habitual sins, our unsaved families, or our undelivered families from, from whatever habits and things they have. We need resurrection power over bondages and, and things that have us chained up by Satan. We need resurrection power from the pressure that sin, that sin nature we have produced. But that's painful to go through the process of allowing that resurrection power to destroy that. And that's how that has to happen. So when we read verse, verse 18 through 21, it says, well, I consider from the standpoint of faith that suffering from this present life is not worthy to be compared with the glory that's about to be revealed to us. And verse 19, for even the whole creation, all nature, waits eagerly for the children of God to be revealed. For creation was subject to the frustration and fertility, not willingly because of some intentional fault on its part, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself would also be freed from its bondage to, de uh, to decay and gain interest into the glorious freedom of the children of God. So suffering brings victory. When we get physically hurt, like I said, we have pain, but that pain is there to defeat the problem. So we must suffer through the pain so that we can solve the problem. And verse 22 says, but we know that the world, whole creation is being mourning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So we were talking about childbirth. We were talking about uh, growing spiritual things. And we were talking about giving birth to spiritual things of God. So we see how through these different passages that these words are repeated so that we can understand how it's done. And not only this, but we too have the first fruits of the spirit, a joyful indication of the blessing to come. Even we groan in, inwardly as we wait eagerly for the sign of our adoption as sons and the redemption and transformation of our body at the resurrection. So the pains of childbirth until now, we too have the first fruit. That's an indication of the blessing that is to come. And we're groaning eagerly for the signs of our adoption as sons. So for this hope, we sa we're saved by faith, but the hope, but hope the object of, which is not seen, for, for who hopes for what is already sees. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait eagerly for the for it with patience and composure. So if we already can see how we can get rid of stuff, that would be fine. But we have to use our faith because that's not faith. We have to use our faith for things that we cannot see because 
our world is more real in the spirit than it is in the natural. So, so the spirit world is our reality. That's what's real to us. We can't see it. So we have to use our faith. We can't see it. So we want to have our victory in Christ. And that's what we do when we, uh, we read verse 26 and 27. In the same way, the spirit comes to us and helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it as we should. But the spirit himself knows our need and at the right time intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groaning to deep for words, too deep for words. And he searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the spirit is because the spirit intercedes before God on behalf of God's people in accordance with God's will. So there are some things in our hearts that are not the will of God, but Holy Spirit sees those and he has groanings and he intercedes for us to make sure that the things happen according to God's will. So now in verse 28, it says, and we know with great confidence that God who has deeply concerned for us causes all things to work together as a plan for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. So when challenges come because of things being outside of God's will, God uses those things for our good to make sure that we don't fail. So when our family have challenges, uh, do we consider that these things are working for our good? Or do we complain and try to get rid of them because of the pain? You know, no one likes to take a trip to the dentist, as I said. But when the problem comes, the pain comes. And we need to respond to the pain by suffering through it so we can get rid of the problem that caused it. Verse 29 through 30. For those who he foreknew and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately share his complete sanctification so that he would be the firstborn, the most beloved honored among many believers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those who called, he also justified, declared free of the guilt of sin. And those whom he justified, he also glorified, raising them to a heavenly dignity. Now, why are all these things seemingly bad, challenging, happening? It's happening because God is conforming us to the image of his son. He is conforming us to the image of Jesus his first begotten son. Because we are sons and, and we, need to, we need to be like Jesus. We must be just like him. God expects us to be like him. So this means that we must obey the father the same way Jesus did. And so the spirit of God makes sure that we obey him in areas that we don't know about. He makes sure that happens. So we are saved, you know, are saved from, uh, we're called by him. We're justified by him uh, and we're predestined by him and we're glorified by him. That means all of us. Uh, and sometimes we don't, as people, and I was one of them, we don't believe that God did this for us. We believe he did it for other people, but not for us, you know, but he did it for all of us. So if you were in the ones like I was, who didn't believe God did all of this for, for me, but he did it for everybody else, then you have to say me too. Me too. He did this for me too. So verse 31 through 33 says, what then shall we say to all these things? If God be for us, who can be successful against us? Wow. Now that's a big one because that's one of the reasons we do all of those worldly peaceful things because people are operating against us. But this passage says, who can be against us? Anything, anybody that's doing against us, God is using that to work for our good. And so we can be peaceful. We can be at peace. We can be confident when things start happening. God, you're working it out for my good. Just help me hold on. Help me not get off, off the same page you're on and help me not go in the wrong direction. Because right now, you know, I feel like I just want to slap somebody. You know, and so God will do it. And verse 32 says, he who he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? 
his chosen one. So we don't have to fear people. We have to get delivered from people. We must get delivered from people, especially families and friends, family members and friends. We cannot expect not to obey God because we're being intimidated by family and friends. Oh, it don't take all that much, you know, and, and, and they don't like what you said. And sometimes you'll grow a little more in the spirit than they do. And what you said won't be comfortable because they're not ready to go there. But we must, we cannot be uh, intimidated by that because if God didn't spare his own son, he's certainly gonna correct us. He's not gonna let us go down that path without correcting us. It is God who justified us, declaring us blameless. And I'm in verse, I'm finishing up verse 33 and going to 34. And in right relationship with himself, verse 34. Who is the one who condemns us? Christ Jesus is the one who died to pay for our penalty. And the more than that, who was raised from the dead? And who is at the right hand of God interceding with the Father for us? Who shall ever separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Just as it is written and forever remain written, for your sake we are put to death all day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. So, Things come to us to cause us to put our flesh to death all day long. And, and, and they come in this kind of form. God has purposed us to win. So we can stop letting people take us to places we should not go. You know, we must not listen to people who are constantly trying to get us to do things, to do things to be accepted. We already see that God has accepted us. He's protected us. He chose us. We're predestined, he's taking care of that, and he's not gonna let anybody do anything that he won't use to work for our good. Even though it does seem like he's working it out, he is working it out. We can't let people cause us to do things just because we want them to love us and because they have un unreasonable conditions for love. Love is First Corinthians 13, there's those 14 habits that we did on our first session. If they're not doing that, they're not loving you in any way, so you have to go ahead and be at peace with that. Be at peace with that. We have to stop letting people uh, cause us to do things because we want to be appreciated and, and because we are not appreciated before what we did. Stop letting people cause us to do things in that dark area of how the world finds peace because we want people to approve us even on our jobs, you know, or to receive us. I receive something, you know, that's already ours. We have to just stop getting, let that happen because God has already said, I'm working that out for your good. So verse 37 now, <clears throat> verse 37 through 39 says, yet all these things, we are more than conquerors and we gain an overwhelming victory through him who loved us so much that he died for us. So remember he told us we can't be cowards. He said, you can't be a coward now. And this is the reason right here. He says, you are more than a conqueror. Don't be a coward. You know, don't be a coward. You're more than a conqueror. And you gain an overwhelming victory through me, which is him, his word, and Holy Spirit doing what his word said and doing what you said for the, to do if that is according to his word. So he died for us. We can't let other people be our God. When people start coming to us, well, if I were you, I would do this or I would do that. Well, you're not God. You didn't create me. You didn't do all this stuff Jesus did for me. I'm going to do what Jesus said do. I'm not going to do what you said do. Just because I want you to accept me. Just because I want you to love me. Just because I want you to appreciate me. Just because I want you to approve me. Just because I want you to receive me. I am not. I am going to do what Jesus said I should do because he's the one that gave his life. He's the one that came here. He's the one that chose not to use his deity. He chose not to use his deity to suffer the way we suffer so that I could be free. No, I'm not going to let you intimidate me to do all this stuff. I'm going to do what Jesus said and I'm going to have peace. You know what? I am going to go to the store 
and get me a Coke, a cup of coffee, or a, a piece of cake, or a, 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 an apple, an orange, or whatever I need to do, and I'm going to have peace. You keep on doing what you're doing, but I'm going to have peace. I'm going to move it on to this next thing. I am going to have peace. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let you have that happen to me, you know? So verse 38 says, for I am convinced and continue to be convinced that beyond any doubt that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present and threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, uh, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate me from the unlimited love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what he's saying here it is beyond any doubt that there's nothing the banks can do. There's nothing corporations can do. There's nothing the federal government can do. There's nothing the state government or the local government can do. There's nothing my family can do. There's nothing my friends can do. There's nothing my church can do. There's nothing anybody can do to harm me because whatever they're doing is going to work for my good. Beyond any doubt that God can't separate me from God. I, it, it, you know, you can't separate me from God. You can't. There's only one thing that people can do in this earth and that's kill a physical body, which is already dead. They can't do anything else because we're spirits, you know? So there's nothing that anybody can do. And when we're looking at this list of things, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present or threatening, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor any other created thing. A good example of that is David. You know, if we want to give an example, I'm going to give David as an example. Because no matter what happened, no matter what Saul did, no matter what David did, even with Bathsheba, no matter what the Philistines did, what, no matter all of David's challenges and the flaws he had to fight, nothing changed God's mind about his throne being the throne forever for Christ. Now, David did some pretty strange things. So why would we think that what we do and what has happened to us would cause God not to do that for us. We can't. The Holy Spirit is here to help us. And he's helped us to do things. And we have to let him do things. We have to allow it to happen. Because like I said, he's not going to jump in and, and do anything. He help, He's our helper. He's our enabler. He's not our doer. So when we decide to do something, he uses the power of God to make it happen. God does not have any favorites. So he does this for everybody. He does this for everybody. So we want to make sure that we understand that. You know, um, you know, because we're, <clears throat> why do these things happen to us? Why do things happen to us that we don't understand? You know, and anybody ever ask God, why you let that happen, God? Why did you let that happen? Well, anybody but me ever did that? You know, ask God, why you let that happen? It was because we are pregnant with things that we don't understand that he's doing on our behalf. And these things are being attacked. And we, first of all, we don't even know those things that he's doing on our behalf exist. And those things are being attacked. And now we're trying to figure out what happened? What happened when God is trying to protect us? And that's what 1 Corinthians, uh, I mean, uh, Romans 8 is talking about. It's given us an understanding that there are things going on in the spirit that we cannot even begin to understand that God is doing for us. And those things are being attacked. And so those things, right along with some other things that we know about, that we should not let any of that steal our peace because we're in charge of our peace. If we don't do those things that the world do to get peace and we follow Jesus' direction, and we go through Romans 8, like we, like we just said, and we not allow things to steal our peace and understand all things work together for our good. And then we have to suffer in order to enjoy the power of his resurrection. Remember this, that suffering of that power of that resurrection destroys the thing that's hurting you. 
That's what I want you to take away from here. That suffering, that pain that that person is putting you through, that pain that that organization is putting you through, that sorrow that you're feeling because you're being rejected and put aside, all of that is working for your good. And the pain of that is destroying the thing that's doing that to you or the thing that's in you that's receiving it so that you can be free. That resurrection power is freeing you from that pain. Don't run from the pain. Let the resurrection power do its job because that's what Holy Spirit is doing. He is doing his job, getting rid of that. Getting rid of that. As often as we have studied Romans chapter eight, we still are quoted, but we won't live by it. We must learn to live by this. It's working out for my good. It don't look good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't sound good. And I think I might have to talk to God about this because it just seemed to be a big problem. But it's working out for our good because he won't do anything that's not. He will not do anything that's not working out for our good. We do things, but he won't. He'll take that and he'll make it work for us. Okay, let's go to the next slide, Michelle. So we have a win-win situation here on earth. God has covered everything that we could possibly encounter. Satan is defeated and we are free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. All we need to do is to seek the Lord's help which you're talking about the Holy Spirit, and to make sure that we have all the help we need, he sent Holy Spirit when he left to help us. That's all the help we need. We as believers won't let him help us. We have to let him. He will not make us. You know, he'll see us falling in a ditch and he will tell us if we ask, but he'll let us fall in the ditch if we don't want to talk to him. We have to say, God, help me. I don't understand this. What should I say? What should I do? And I guarantee you, you're going to get that thought about what to do. And you just have to get sensitive to it and start paying attention to it so that you can recognize it. Because like me, I still thought it was me for the longest time until I started seeing what I was doing. I shouldn't have done it because I had the first thought. So now I just move on my first thought. I don't try to figure out what the second thought was. And God don't wait for you to get the second thought. He gives you the first thought so that you don't have to worry about the second thought. Good? Okay. So we don't have to fear anybody. Oh, I, I've skipped something. Satan is defeated and we are free from the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And all we need to do is seek the Lord's help and make sure that we have all the help we need that he sent us the Holy Spirit when he left. We do not have to fear anybody or anything else because God did not give us fear. He gave us a helper and that cannot be defeated. And we see that in Hebrews 13, six. So we have, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's the word of God on it. I wasn't just telling you something I thought. This is the word in Hebrews that's saying, we will not fear about what men do to us, whether they're working in a company, whether they're working in a fast food place, whether they're working in the grocery store or the furniture store, whatever they're doing, we will not fear if there are family members. We will not fear for the Lord is our helper and we will seek his help. Now we may be wondering, why must we deal with sin at all if we're so free? It is because we're not free from the presence of sin. And because of that, God has given us everything that we need in order to win every time. Jesus said that. Uh, he, was, he, he, he said that was in full agreement. He was in full agreement with what the father had commanded him to do. And that he did what the father tells him to do so that the world may know that he loved the father. Uh, that lets us know that if we do what Jesus Christ, who is the word of God, told us to do, that, that's follow his word. He is the word. I'm talking about the word that we're following because that's who he is. Uh, do what, uh, do that would indicate that we love him 
And because we love him, we also love the Father and we love Holy Spirit. So Jesus went to the cross. We, we know we use this, but I think we still think that he was God. That's why he did it. He went to the cross and he said on the cross, Father, forgive them. But he didn't say it to them like we like to do. He said it to the Father. They never heard it. And so he's saying to us, you can have this same kind of victory. All you have to do is get through the thing that's troubling you. That pain is there to let you know that there's a problem. And when you get that problem in your heart and in your mind and in your life, if you ask Holy Spirit for help, he will destroy that problem that caused the pain. And that's what Romans 8 is talking about. You know, so we must deliver, get delivered from people, you know, that's trying to control us. You know, that's trying to give us a guilt trip. That's trying to blame us and, 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 and complain about what our motives are. That's trying to tell us that our self-worth is nothing. We must not let people uh, intimidate us and let us know that, oh, you're the only one with infirmities. You know, when people start complaining about what you did wrong, what they're trying to say is, you're the only one with the infirmities that the Holy Spirit need to pray for. The truth of the matter is every person on this planet has these infirmities that Holy Spirit needs to pray for because we were all born in sin and we were sinning up until the time we got saved. The only person the Bible said that had Holy Spirit in the womb was John the Baptist. And we saw his life. And none of us lived a life like John the Baptist. So therefore we have to understand we need to stop working for love. We need to stop working for approval. And we need to understand that sin is still present and we need to refuse to cooperate with it. I'm not cooperating with sin, even sin in me. You know, even sin in me. So we have to understand that. And that's one of the big things that cause us not to implement Romans 8 in our life because we don't understand that that pain is identifying the thing that the Holy Spirit wants to kill. And so we keep it because we don't want to deal with the pain. We have to start letting it go so we can get rid of the pain and get rid of the problem. Okay, next slide, Michelle. Okay, so remember what we said earlier that the Holy Spirit lives in us as Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. And since he is in us, we take him everywhere we go. He is always present to help us. If we yield to his ministry, he is truly our enabler because he is the one doing the work. He is the one with the power and he wants us to do to, to ask him for help. He wants us to ask him for help. So now let's think about this. Let's just think about this. When we go somewhere, when we go somewhere, we may go somewhere anywhere. We may go without our keys because we lost them or left them home. We may go without our cell phone. We may go without a family member. We need to help us carry something heavy. We may go without a checkbook because we left it or don't have one. We may lose our wallet and not have it. We, we, we may leave our money in the car and go, so have to go back and get it. Or even our debit card. We may have not, not have that, but we will never be anywhere without Holy Spirit. We will never have an excuse for not asking him to help. We will never be without him. We will never have an excuse to, to say, well, he wasn't here. If he was here, I would have asked him. If he was here, I would have used him. If he was here, I would have let him take care of this. And see, the bottom line is we are the vessel. We're going to talk about that next. But, but since we have authority over the earth and we have dominion, God's not going to usurp that. He's not going to interrupt that. He wants us to ask him. That power of the Holy Ghost is in the Holy Ghost. That's God. God put himself in us. 
so that he could glorify himself through us. So it's not our power. It's not us healing people. It's God in us that's doing the healing. It's not us getting people delivered. It's God in us that's doing it. It's not us that getting our finances straight and getting bondages broken and people free. It's God in us. God himself is doing that via Holy Spirit. We have to let him, invite him. And the reason we're not successful is because we don't and we're trying to do it ourselves, which we don't have the authority to do it without him. Jesus gave us that authority when he was here. We talked about that the last session we had. And he left Holy Spirit here with us with that same authority to do everything that we need done. All we have to do is let him do his job. That's our big problem. We will not let Holy Spirit do his job. You know, we'll let him do a few things. I know people will say, uh, ask him if they lost it, they lost the phone. Where's the phone? I tell people that. I'm talking to somebody on the phone and they'll say, man, I can't find my phone. Now, look, I used to tell them, okay, hang up. I'm going to call you so you can hear it. Now I tell them, ask Holy Spirit. And do you know what? He tells them and they go right to it and pick it up. You know, so I'm just encouraging you. Please be encouraged. Please be encouraged. Let Holy Spirit do his work. Let him do his job. Let him do it. And so that's it for this. We have finished Holy Spirit, our enabler and our helper. Uh, and so we have finished that for, for this evening. So I'm going to ask somebody to explain to me uh, what you have heard that will help you let Holy Spirit enable you and help you. Anybody? Can anybody? Um, does anybody have anything that will that you learn that will let you uh, that will help you allow Holy Spirit to help you either tonight or last week? Either one. Anybody? Nobody learned anything new to help them? Anybody? How about you, Michelle? Okay, so for me, real, you know, I think we know that Holy Spirit has the power. But I think just you reinforcing it and saying it again tonight is that, you know, we have to let him be him and do his job. And that is something that like I'm really challenged with because I, I tend to get in fear of doing different things. Um, and having to remember as much as I say it, you know, it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit in me, but you know that 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 physical side of you just that's been a challenge for me so just learning to step aside and let holy spirit do the job that he's supposed to do and stop trying to do it myself <laughs> so that's well, what i have to work on I appreciate that because I thought I was the only one. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought I was the only one that had the challenge. You know, um, I really did. I think Evelyn just disappeared. I was getting ready to ask her, but she just disappeared. Is she still there, Michelle? Can you see? No, it looks like she dropped off. Okay. Looks like she dropped off, so she may have had to go. But anyway, Thank you for sharing that, Michelle, because that has been a challenge. And when you are expecting the Lord to do things and he wants to do things and they don't happen, a lot of times because we didn't let him. You know, we did not let him. We did not let him tell us, you know, and he wants to be a part of everything. And like I said, he'll tell me, 
what store to go to to get something. Or he'll tell me what not to do. Uh, and it just be, it's so simple just to hear the, the there's Evelyn, she's back. Okay, Evelyn, I was gonna ask you, uh, did you learn anything to help you or uh, allow the Holy Spirit to help you? Are you speaking? Are you, are you there, Evelyn? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, it was um, when you were talking about the Holy, um, how peace, was allowing us to be intimidated, but peace gives us, allow us to know that God is truthful and that he will not allow us to be ignorant of his word. He will always open up his word to us so that we will know his word and that we will be able to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and that his word is always truthful and that we can always count on his word, that his word will never leave us nor forsake us because we can always find peace in his word and joy. Well, good. And I, I, I'm sharing a lot of this with you. Remember now, this is thing, these are things that God taught me when I was studying over the years, this book was based on him teaching me about these things that I'm sharing with you. And I was afraid. I was afraid, like Michelle said. <laughs> I was scared to trust God. I hid from him. Now, how are you going to hide from God? <laughs> he would tell me, you're hiding. <laughs> I did not want, I was scared. And, you know, you know, you really have to be off the page if you're going to hide from God who knows and sees everything. I, I did not think I was going to get away with that. But see, that that is a trick of the enemy. I wasn't going to get away with it. And I didn't. He told me I was hiding, you know, and he didn't argue with me about hiding. You know, when he told me I was hiding, he told me I was hiding when I decided to come out. <laughs> when I decided not to hide. That's what he told me. I was like, he didn't beat me up about hiding. You know, he was telling me about an Indian tribe in Florida that <laughs> they they escaped being killed and controlled by hiding deeper into the forest from the folks that was trying to catch it, and they would go deeper into the forest. It's very dangerous, very dangerous. You know what they did, but they did that, you know, and I know we have some in some tribes like that are still doing that in the Amazon. And um, there's some people like that that's still happening in the Amazon uh, area of the Amazon. <clears throat> but anyway, I was scared. And so I hid and I wouldn't let God do stuff. And I, then I complained because he was doing stuff for other folks and wasn't doing it for me. Anybody like that to complain? God doing things for other people I'm praying for and I'm watching miracles happening in their life and all this thing I'm praying for them. And, and the people call me up and say, you know, God answers your prayer. Well, how would you gonna say God answered my prayer? You got your prayer answered. Now you, you didn't pray for yourself. So you didn't believe God would answer your prayer, but you believed he'd answer my prayer. Just like I didn't believe that he would do for me when I just prayed for you. You know? So that person was just as messed up as I was, just as <laughs> they, they could have prayed for themselves and still got it, you know. But anyway, I just want us to not be like that, not have that problem. You know, we don't want to go to heaven and have God say, look, all I wanted you to do was let me help you. <laughs> Here you are, you missed out all of you missed out all of this fellowship that I wanted to have with you because you wouldn't let me and I can't make you. You have to invite me. So I just, I encourage all of us to just be, just be conscious of it and, and try to implement it in your life, you know, because it just makes the difference. It makes the difference. I was 
I was, I, I share my testimony because I do want you to get it. Yesterday, I was, um, I wanted to get something for my family to eat and I didn't want to spend a lot of money, you know? So I was coming home and I said, gee, I had such a wonderful meal and I was just so full I could hardly move. <laughs> and then I said, I don't have anything to eat at home. And so I was saying, well, God, what, I, what can I get? You know, because I don't, I don't have a lot of money spent on that right now. But I had a coupon from Kentucky laying in my tray in the car. I wasn't even thinking about it. And so I'm driving down the road and he says, Kentucky. And so, I, and, and so I'm conscious now. You just gave me a thought. What about Kentucky? You got a coupon there that you can get them. 10 pieces of chicken, two sides, and biscuits for just this little bit of money on this coupon. I wouldn't have thought of that. I would not have thought of that. All he said was Kentucky. You see, if, if, if we just go ahead and let him, and let him, and you know, sometimes I feel him smiling in, 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 in my inner man when I obey, because he hurts. When, you know, the reason we feel hurt is because it's in him. We can't have anything in us that's not in God. It hurts him when we don't let him. If somebody love you and you won't let them do anything for you, you know how to happens. So we, we're going to do better, aren't we? We're going to do better. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna let him do what he does. Okay, Michelle, we're done for the night. What, what, what do you have next week? What do we have next week? <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about an earthen vessel. Uh, that's not a subject that I had heard a lot about. It was mentioned a few times when I was growing up in church, but um, it's a long subject. So it's going to be like the Holy Spirit. We won't be able to do it in one or two sessions. So we're going to talk about the mystery of the earthen vessel. And that subject is going to be the end of the subject of this particular um, book, The Power of the Earth. And we will, when we finish this one, we'll be starting another, another topic. Okay, so next week, the mystery of the earthen vessel. All right, you can take that down so we can pray. Our Father and our God, we just thank you and we praise you for your worthy of worship. You're worthy of praise. You're worthy of honor. We love it and appreciate you, Lord. You alone are worthy and you alone are God. You are everything that was and is and ever shall be. And we want your help, God. We want, to, we want you to participate in the things that we do because we understand now that that's what you want. We did not always understand that you wanted to participate in everything in our life. We just thought that you choose particular things you just wanted to do, but, but we know now that you want to participate in absolutely everything. And so God, we are yielding to your ministry, Holy Spirit. We are yielding to your ministry and we're listening to you, allowing you to lead, guide and direct us, God. Help us, God, you are our helper and our enabler. And we do not want to hurt or grieve you. We want to participate. And so we thank you right now because we know we need to ask you for help to do this. We know that we can't just turn on a light switch and it happens. We know that it's going to be a process, but we also know that when we ask you to do anything, that you do it. And you, you don't even have to remember that you, that you said yes, because you do say yes at the point of prayer. So I pray for everyone on this call and everyone on this Zoom and everyone that will see it via social media, whether it be Facebook, Instagram, or whether it be Twitter, wherever it is that it's shared, that I thank you, <clears throat> that you would bless whatever they put their hands to, that you would lead and guide and direct them as they purpose in their heart, God, to not follow the peace of this world and just to step into this peaceful place and be confident in anything that's happening to them that have peace about it and not be concerned about it because you are in control and because you love us. We thank you for each and every person that's on here and those that will watch it later. And we ask you to bless their families, Lord, lead, guide, and direct them, help them, God, in any way that you know that they need. But we know that you will not 
override anybody's will. So Father, we thank you for anybody that needs their appetite dealt with, that you would give them an appetite for more of you and less of the things that harm them. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So that's it for tonight. I'm glad to see you, Jackie. Good night, Michelle, Evelyn. Oh, we have a new person on there. Is that you, Patricia? I bet that's Patricia. But anyway, good night, everybody. We'll see good you night. next week. We'll see you next good week. Night. See you next week.